Hello, everyone. Good, good afternoon. Good uh, morning. Actually, it depends on where you are on the plan right now. Um, welcome to this uh, last book presentation of, of this year, you know, before the, the summer here in, in Europe. We are delighted. This is actually, this has been a very intensive um, series that, you know, has taken us, you know, all over uh, the planet from Latin America to Asia, uh, Western and Eastern Europe, uh, also Latin America. And we're going to finish the, um, the series actually with one of the projects that we are very, very excited about. Uh, many MS members have been a part of, of this project. And we have some of them here today, but mostly uh, we also have Il Cheon uh, Yi. He's the coordinator of the Encyclopedia of the Social and Solidarity Economy that was put together as part of the United Nations Task Force on Social and Solidarity Economy. He's a senior uh, researcher at UNRISD, and he's been really behind this, this tough work of coordinating, getting in, you know, the, the, the most out of this collective work, which is definitely what, what, what it is. It's also been very nice to see it coming to, to light this, you know, around the same time. Actually, it was the same month, right, it's John, that the, that the, um, that the big uh, resolution was approved uh, by, the, by the United Nations. So really, it's, it's a, a beautiful coincidence, uh, you know, for all of us who have been, you know, working and defending and, and researching the social and solidarity economy for, for many years, but also very exciting moment uh, for yeah. those who, who are well, coming. Um, then, yeah, let me just, I'm going to, there you go. So without further ado, I'm just going to pass the floor on to Il Cheon, who is our guest uh, host and, and coordinator today. Thank you to all of you, you know, to the uh, MS members and, and contributors who are here, you know, with your time, your enthusiasm and for continuing to be a part of, of this network. And I'm really, really looking forward to today's session. Il Cheong, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rocio. And good morning, good afternoon, good, good, and good evening uh, to the participants from different parts of the world. And uh, I'm Il Cheong as I introduced, uh, I'm Senior Research Coordinator at UNRIST, or United Nations Research Institute for uh, Social Development. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Lucio Nogales, the administrator of the MS International Research Network and the organizers of this prestigious MS anniversary uh, book series. Uh, as you know, um, today's book we are going to talk about is the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia of the Social and Solidarity Economy, which is the kind of first in its own kind. Um, this book was designed as a kind of response to a concern that uh, despite the growing recognition of the SSE and its potential to contribute to the uh, sustainable development, the SSE uh, remained still a strange or a new concept to many scholars and policymakers. And for those who have uh, some knowledge about the SSE, uh, it is still a very much complicated concept or practice when they explore the relationship between the SSE they already know and the new issues they want to address. So the United Nations Interagency Task Force on the SSE or UNTF SSE and United Nations Research Institute for Social Development or UNRIST decided to make an encyclopedia which can contribute to uh, enriching knowledge and discussions on various aspects of the SSE, uh, raising awareness of the SSE and making comprehensive knowledge and information on the SSE available to a wider audience. Uh, as you know, UNRIS is the implementing agency of the UN Task Force Knowledge Hub. So it organized an editorial group of 11 wonderful editors in 2021. And Rocio uh, with us here uh, is one of those wonderful editors. And editorial group has had many consultations with the SSE scholars and 
practitioners to identify uh, relevant entries and select authors. More than uh, 150 uh, meetings uh, or consultations have been held amongst authors and editors. And the encyclopedia, which has brilliant uh, 57 entries on the SSE, was published in 2023, uh, as mentioned by Rocio in April, which is the history month uh, for SSE movement around the world. And it, 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 this adventure or enterprise involves around 70 leading SSE experts from different parts of the world. So um, we made this encyclopedia as open access because we wanted to have more uh, people can read uh, this encyclopedia and, uh, you know, and more people can disseminate this encyclopedia to uh, those guys uh, with an interest in SSC and related aspects uh, of SSC to other issues in development. So um, today we invited four brilliant scholars who contributed entries to this encyclopedia and they will talk about more detailed stories about their entries and the, then their work on the SSE in general. So we have Professor Kate Cooney, Yale University. Uh, we have Ricardo Bodini, Uixe. And uh, we have Lucian Lucas dos Santos, University of Coimbra. And Professor Tabuka Bidovic, University of Jaguar. So uh, first of all, thank you all for being with us today. And I'd like to ask uh, all the participants uh, or the panelists today to give us a kind of short introduction about the entries uh, they wrote uh, for the encyclopedia first, and then uh, we can have discussions. Kate Cooney, uh, unfortunately, could not be with us today, So, uh, but she sent us video. So maybe we can begin with her video first. Hi, my name is Kate Cooney. I'm a senior lecturer at the Yale School of Management, and I'm going to be speaking on behalf of myself and my co-authors, Mark Neesons and Mary O'Shaughnessy, about the, on the entry we crafted for the encyclopedia of the social and solidarity economy. Uh, and our entry was on work integration, social enterprises. So how was the process of crafting those contributions? Well, our process was, was made easier by the fact that in 2016, the three of us co-edited a special edition of the journal Nonprofit Policy Forum, volume seven, number four, looking at the history of public policies and work integration social enterprises across different country contexts. And at the time we were looking at work coming out of Ireland, the United States, Japan, Austria, and Switzerland. So in crafting our entry for the encyclopedia, we drew on the work we had done conceptually back for that 2016 article, um, but also from some of the work that Mart and Mary had done uh, in the meantime since since that special edition. So one of the questions that we're asked to reflect on in this webinar is to think about the challenges encountered when drafting a definition of a type, in our case, a type of social enterprise, considering that the audience is global. And in our case, being a part of the MS Research Network and the Ixum Research Project, you know, that global perspective has always been a central part of our research endeavor. So going back to those very early days, we were looking at social enterprise models across different country contexts. Um, and we were always thinking about, you know, both what was similar and different about the evolution of, in our case with WISE, is what's a, a very old form of social enterprises in many, in many country contexts. So for our work, uh, both for the encyclopedia and earlier for that special edition, we actually just centered on that variance right from the start. We sort of named it categorically and set out to think about uh, theoretically, what are the dimensions 
of the factors contributing to those the variance in the evolution of these forms in different political, economic, and institutional environments. So we arrived at this notion of wises as operating at the nexus of public policy, market, and community, and present you know, a framework for understanding the emergence of these forms as shaped by the evolution of the welfare state that is unfolding differently in different country contexts. Um, so, so on the one hand, we set out to, to think about, you know, how the variance in wises in their, in their models relate to this variance in historic welfare state configurations and the evolution of those configurations over time through the neoliberal moment and, and now even potentially beyond. Um, but then secondly, to also describe the broad range of the modes of work integration that exist in these models and the resource mix. You know, there's a there's a range of resource mixes as well. And how those different modes of work integration and resource mixes might correlate with different uh, kinds of country context um, factors. And so we see some wises that are much more closely aligned with the local public bodies, others that are much more market oriented and rely almost exclusively on private resource mixes. And then finally, we thought about sort of across all these contexts, some of the common opportunities and constraints or you know, promises and challenges that this model faces rolling up some of the things that we had learned from examining this model, both over time and across country country contexts. And in terms of my own research and this question about the benefit of being involved with an international research community, you know, from the very start, you know, many years ago when I was writing my dissertation, it's just been hugely impactful and important. I still remember when I found Martin Newson's book, edited book on Wises, I was sitting in the basement office of the UCLA graduate uh, student suite, um, coming upon those amazing theoretical essays at the end of the book and just finding so much grist for moving my own work forward. And it was both, you know, a sense of excitement, um, you know, that sense of recognition when you realize you're part of a larger group of scholars who are studying similar questions, the rapid evolution of your own thinking that can occur when um, when you're considering uh, these other arguments, and the way in which by shifting your vantage point and looking at wises in a different country context, you know, th how that can bring your own country context into even uh, sharper uh, relief. But then there's also the warm welcome that I received from the MS community. Um, you know, that first conference, I think Trento, Italy was my first, um, my first MS conference and just the wonderful conversations and then eventually collaborations and mentorship that followed. Um, you know, when you're hooded at UCLA to receive your PhD, part of the ceremony is is being inducted into this global community of scholars. And for me, so early in my career to feel that connection to the global scholarly community was both exciting and just hugely formative. So thank you. Great, well, thank you for the invitation um, to this presentation. And thank you, Will Chong, for your work uh, coordinating and editing the encyclopedia, which I think is a, like I was saying before the meeting started, a, a great and very useful initiative for all the people who work in the SSC or interested in the SSC or also do research on the SSC. So I think it's a very useful resource for all of these different categories uh, of people. Uh, just very briefly, um, I was co-author in two entries. Uh, one is lead author and one is co-author. Both co-authored with Gianluca Salvatore, both of Eurixe, and both entries have to do with finance uh, in relation to the SSC in two different ways. Uh, the entry I co-author was about the organizations within the SSC that work in the financial sector. So is the um, 
all the different kinds of organizations that are SSC organizations and have as their mission providing financial resources to individuals, to families, to businesses, and so forth. The second entry uh, was actually about financial mechanisms for SSC organizations. And those two things are slightly different, right? In the, in the first instance, we're talking about SSC organization providing finance. In the second instance, we're talking about what kind of finance is available to SSC organizations, regardless of who's providing it. So including from for-profit sector, from public sector, from other types, other worlds. Uh, the question, though, it's interesting in, is to see what are the financial mechanisms that, regardless of who's providing them, are more compatible or tailored to the specificities of uh, social and solidarity economy organizations. We know that given the specificities of these organizations, not all finance is actually uh, useful uh, for them or, or tailored to their goals. And so that's what that entry uh, in particular was about. We had an advantage, I'd say, in writing these two entries, especially the second one. Um, and the advantage was that we were starting from scratch. We had just completed a big project for the ILO on financial mechanisms for social and solidarity economy organizations, a big kind of international research project that had, as uh, especially as the first part, uh, also the ambition of developing a little bit of a kind of theoretical framework and looking at literature and looking at uh, different types of sources to reconstruct what is the kind of a complete categorization of financial mechanisms with their different uh, characteristics and the different ways in which they work. And then we also did some empirical work. We did analysis in eight different countries to see how these financial mechanisms were uh, working or not for social and solidarity economy organizations. So we had a, a lot of uh, work already done uh, that helped inform our entries. Um, also because in that work, clearly we also looked at financial organizations within the SSC providing those mechanisms. Um, and so we had a good starting point. The, the, the work for us was in this, in the case of the entry on financial mechanisms, kind of boiling it down to a condensed enough format that would still be exhaustive in the presentation, but compatible with the length of uh, the SSC entry and obviously, you know, making sure it worked as a kind of self-contained uh, piece without all the context of the project that had generated those insights. So that was, you know, what, what the work was uh, in that case. The other entry was a little bit um, harder because we had some pieces of work already done, but then we had to draw also from a lot of other research and other work that we had done or other people had done on uh, financial organizations in the social and solidarity economy. And so um, that's what that, you know, that, that process uh, was about. So this is just to give you a brief introduction of what we actually did. Um, I don't know, Chong, if this is enough for now, or you want me to go into more of the details, or we do a second round? Just... We're going to have second round, don't worry. OK, great. So I'll stop here, and then we can talk more later. OK, thank you very much, Ricardo. And I just put the uh, web link for Ricardo's uh, entries, so you can have a look at them uh, in chat box. And um, I'm going to invite Lucien for your introduction of your entry. Lucien, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yu Chong. Uh, sorry for not spelling correctly your name. I'm trying hard, but sometimes I no, you, cannot. Your pronunciation was perfect. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I think that until the end of our of our session, I will. I will learn to to promptly and correctly uh, say your name. Every Korean right. in this room uh, could understand. So don't worry. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Yu Chung, uh, for this invitation. And first of all, I would like to to thank you, Rocio and Yu Chung, for the invitation to participate in this session. It's a great pleasure to be with you today sharing some ideas on the entries I wrote about. As asked by Rocio, I will say some words about the process of crafting these entries 
namely on the contributions of the past yeah. you know, to social solidarity economy and the need of that... Το πήρα, νομίζω όταν είχα πάει στην Ιρλανδία. Sorry, sorry. Can I ask? I'm Oops. I think I think now you can go on. Okay. Apologies for that. Oh, do not worry. So uh, I will say some words about the process of crafting these entries, namely on the contributions of the post-colonial thoughts. Uh, to social solidarity economy and the needed dialogue between social solidarity economy and indigenous economies. This letter, an issue that has been still poorly addressed. The second aspect to be here discussed has to do with the challenge of writing for a global audience. And thirdly, how international networks could be of help to make these challenging perspectives more visible and present in the social and solidarity economy agenda. First of all, I would like to explain why this entry, post-colonial studies, uh, and I will be focusing uh, on it, uh, why this entry might be so relevant for a Western context. The fact is that we have naturalized uh, the world according to a division in two groups the West and the Westernized contexts. There is much more than that, of course, but we can see this trend in the way Western-based concepts and perspectives have assumed ontological precedence to use an expression of the Sudanese economist, Eamon Zayel Abidin, in the way solutions for common problems are forged. This trend illustrates to what extent we needed to discuss further and even challenge the roots of some globalized ideas. Some of them important to the results we aim to achieve, such as inclusion, local development, community resilience, to name but a few. The process of crafting this entry was not easy, despite the fact that the post-colonial theories have been applied to different fields of knowledge, anthropology, sociology, architecture, and many others. However, economics was not the, only, the last one to be considered, but has demonstrated active resistance to encompass perspectives such as social and solidarity economy. In addition to that, we can say economics is now being questioned by post-colonial theories. The presence of this kind of theoretical framework and social and solidarity economy is almost inexistent except in one or two pieces of work. In this sense, writing an entry such as these is indeed a challenging. And what are the main ideas that, that this entry on post-colonial studies aims to support? Which were the goals underlying the writing of this entry? So let us talk about the goals and challenges considering this absence in the social and solidarity economy literature. What I would like to do in this entry was, first, to provide an overview of the main ideas regarding this theoretical approach. Two, to reflect upon the narrative of development, a key word in projects and policies, be they regarding the West context or the ones that have been misconceived as underdeveloped in the global South. And three, to analyze how biases associated with this misinterpretation might forfeit initiatives, programs, and policies bridging social solidarity economy and goals such as of inclusion, resilience, participation, gender, and racial equity, to name but a few. It's important to recall that these words are of undeniable value. The question is, to what extent is the prevalent understanding of these concepts capable of detecting and avoiding bias in social and solidarity economy strategies in the territories, be they located here or in the global south? Before going further, let us understand a bit, a bit more the context post-colonial studies refer to. 
they have focused on the issues of misrepresentation, being critical of modern Western-based universalized concepts and perspectives. Usually associated with the Anglo-Saxon world and located into the cultural studies field, their borders might seem to be blurred when it comes to distinguished like-minded approaches such as the anti-colonial readings in Césaire, Franz Fanon, Albert Memmi, for example, the subaltern studies as Dipesh Chakrabarti and Gayatri Spivak's uh, approaches, and the colonial movement in which Aníbal Quirano, Walter Mignolo, and Maria Lugones stand out for their groundbreaking work. Three main ideas in the entry, in this entry, might be said to be discussed. And here we can see more clearly the relevance for the field of social and solidarity economy. That the post-colonial theories might unveil how development can be a trapped concept since development might not mean the same for all. Besides the fact that this perspective of development have fed an asymmetric power relation among nations and social groups. The second idea is that post-colonial thought argues for a different look at the otherness, does it stimulate a non-hierarchical approaches to minority focused programs and policies. And three, Post-colonial studies might be of help to detect common biases in the way issues such as community resilience, inclusion policies, participation, and economic democracy are addressed. In the sense, post-colonial lenses can contribute to reigniting the inherent value of community agency, autonomy, and power of choice to the achievement of social, economic, and environmental justice. And to end up, Generally speaking, international networks could foster this awareness regarding the way we have afforded projects and solutions in the field, and the way we have stimulated individuals and organizations towards a change in cultural trends, public policies, and mediation roles. In the sense, it's suggested for key economic social and political players to think more critically about a set of issues, namely that inequality does not mean that the otherness is devoid of agency, that Western-based life quality does not account for coexistent patterns of decent life, that inclusion should not be misinterpreted with the otherness depletion, and that a different approach starts by changing metrics and assessment guidelines. And to really end up, just some words about the second entry, indigenous economies that are in connection with what was said about post-colonial studies and their contribution to social and solidarity economy. Given that popular resilience and other rationales regarding material life are key aspects on solidarity economy initiatives and should be better explored in our approaches. This entry on indigenous economies presents a threefold contribution, a discussion on the principles of economic integration, Polonian principle of economic integration and the everyday economy embeddedness, a reflection upon community-based aesthetics and its connection with these economies, and the political dimension that the domestic domain might assume in both economies. As such, economic principles such as redistribution and reciprocity are as valued as the ever positively evaluated the market. Another important aspect that this entry aims to emphasize is related to the domestic domain and its political dimension, usually neglected. Being socially gendered, domestic domain has been repeatedly neglected as a potential seedbed for a political arena. In these entries, I try to bring back this validation of this political dimension that comes from the communities, from the individuals collectively, and sometimes informally organized, from the solidarity-based social enterprises and so on. So what I would like to emphasize here 
is the political dimension that sometimes we might forget about. And this is the contribution I would like to emphasize regarding these two entries, and thank you. Thank you very much. And we are going to invite uh, Davolka, who wrote about uh, SSE and youth, you know, which everybody has an interest in. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Il Chong, and thank you, Rashia, once more for inviting me to participate in this uh, uh, event. And also thank you for inviting me to participate with my contribution in this, uh, I think, really interesting um, publications that we all contributed to. Um, as Il Chung said, I wrote one entry and it was about youth and social and solidarity economy. Uh, and for those who don't know me, I'm a sociologist by the background. So uh, among other things, I teach um, about um, sociology of Croatian society and uh, youth is one of the huge topic that I cover. So but I didn't know much about, you know, um, youth on global level. So I used that as a starting point in, in creating my contribution. Um, and uh, by using different sources, uh, I mean, it, it is obvious that uh, uh, on a global level, youth faces some similar challenges. Uh, why this um, topic is important uh, from my perspective, it, it has, and the, from the perspective of sociology, Youth is defined as a transitional period from uh, childhood to adulthood. Uh, and in those, if those transition is happening in a society uh, which is uh, unstable uh, 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 with many crises and with a, a patterns such uh, uh, is marked by neoliberal paradigm and uh, climate crisis uh, and so on, the, the many things that we are facing in contemporary society, that transition can be uh, very difficult. And uh, that's why youth faces so many challenges. Um, uh, when we talk about um, uh, uh, taking out the adult roles, uh, that uh, usually means three things, three basic things, uh, taking the role in a, uh, in a family, like uh, reproductive and uh, socializing in a, uh, creating a, a own family uh, in economical sense by uh, becoming economically engaged uh, and productive citizens and in social and political sense by uh, becoming uh, politically and socio uh, socially active citizen. So uh, I tried to, um, to see how um, uh, social and solidarity economy and social, social and solidarity economy um, uh, organizations can um, assist or how they can be used as a, um, to, as a model that will uh, make easy the transitions uh, to, uh, of youth. Uh, so um, I tried to identify, and I hopefully was at least some, some way successful in, in that sense, because uh, as um, Ricardo said, I didn't do this from the scratch because there are some researches on youth and social and solidarity economy, but there are not many of them. And it was difficult to provide uh, some sort of global perspective that can be useful for different societies. So I try to identify four aspects of SSC that can be used in analyzing or discussing on or uh, creating policies uh, for you, uh, how we can merge those two things and how social and solidarity economy can be useful in that transition. Um, that was uh, shortly to explain my, my entry. Uh, I can maybe stop here or you want me to continue about some specific, okay. Thank you very much. I mean, the, uh, at the beginning, I talked about um, kind of more than 70 leading experts on SSE and uh, my job, uh, you know, um, kind of coordination of all those authors was something like uh, being a football team coach uh, who has to deal with Pele, Maradona, Ronaldo, you know, the, all those top players in the world in one team uh, because everybody has different expertise, you know, everybody has different style, different focus, weight, emphasis. But I think, you know, from those um, experts and their explanations about their entries, we can find which area 
should be explored more in the future. And what we have at the moment as a kind of launching pad for future research. So uh, now we're gonna have video by Kate. Are we are we going to have it or or no? No, okay. It did it didn't come in. So we will do it the, the uh, editing later on. Okay, okay. So um, you know, uh, I I put the links for um, those entries. Um, today's author, today's participants or pet panelists wrote about. And if you have any questions about those entries or relevant topics to those entries or encyclopedia itself, you just raise your questions and then we can discuss. Uh, I will open the floor. So if there is not, maybe I, I, I'd like to raise one question to all the authors of entries. You know, um, I, I talked about my difficulty in dealing with this encyclopedia. I'd like to hear what was the most difficult uh, to you in making this entry. Maybe we can begin with uh, Ricardo. Um. Yeah, I'll say maybe two uh, main main difficulties. The, they're related to each other. Um, the the first, uh, and maybe they also speak to something Lucien was saying earlier. Uh, I'd say being exhaustive would definitely be uh, number one in a concise format because we're talking just you know we have a few pages to delve into a topic that could potentially you know take up a, a whole book um but so how do you make sure that within those few pages you cover really everything that is comprised in your uh in your topic and that's probably the most challenging uh thing uh, but the second that's related to that is also speaking to a global audience because the SSC is a global phenomenon, but also it has so many kind of articulations and specificities and there's so many biases in how we approach it as well, based on our own culture, our own knowledge. Um, so dealing with an issue like finance, for instance, the, you know, financial institutions as Europeans, you know, we come at that topic with a very clear preconceived notion of what those institutions might look like, right? Cooperative banks or foundations or things. But there's a lot of uh, other types of ways that are based on the same kind of social and solidarity economy principles of providing finance in a collective uh, way. And, you know, um, and how do you take those, you know, make sure you take those into account. And uh, also we're covering a field in which there's everything from really large, essentially multinational corporations to very informal, small organizations that, you know, function according to some of the basic, same basic principles, but are completely different. So uh, I'd say those are the, the, the two challenges, being exhaustive and also make sure you take into account the old different ways in which the SSC plays out. Uh, within different, in a specific sector, like financial sector in our case, across the world. Great, thank you. Tabulka? Well, uh, I, I would agree with Ricardo with, with uh, at least the first or even both things. Uh, for me, it was uh, quite difficult to, <laughs> to, to use that limited space and limited uh, number of references um, because it was quite few that we uh, could use. Um, and I didn't want to, for me, it was, it was difficult to you know, exclude some of the uh, very important uh, researches or uh, references, but to use some that are more globally oriented and not so specific into some aspects of topic. And uh, of course, I, I wasn't sure that I covered uh, everything, but at some point, I it's there was a need to be satisfied with, with what is written in in that format, and with hope that it can be useful and open 
uh, other researches in some of those directions. Um, maybe um, what I've done, um, and that was suggested by the uh, editor and editorial team, is to use some examples. And uh, I really did a huge search to find examples from different societies, from, uh, from different parts of the globe, that uh, was used like a sort of illustration of what of the dimensions that I uh, mentioned before. Uh, and I thought that maybe that uh, it somehow uh, 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 make the, those dis disadvantages uh, uh, more or less, or less than they are. So they uh, they somehow um, uh, did a, a, a illustrative part that included uh, uh, different parts of the globe. So that's that's how I uh, try to uh, face this, these difficulties to, to speak to global audience. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Lu Lucian. Yeah, uh, I think uh, that the, the number of references, it was a challenge because there are many references that could be understood as relevant uh, in the entries and uh, we needed to choose. It was not a, an easy choice. And secondly, I was concerned about uh, how to write an entry, a comprehensive entry of something that is very broad, uh, not exactly uh, something people are in agreement uh, about, and, uh, and something that could uh, have the, the opposite, uh, what can I say it? Uh, the opposite result. Sometimes post-colonial uh, perspective could uh, set people away uh, from this uh, perspective because they they think that it's not necessary or it's it's something connected with the past or something like that. So how to write something that could be understandable for uh, everybody, take into account the historical context, but the way it continues to be relevant uh, nowadays after the colonization is gone or the social and political colonization is gone. So it, it was not easy to, to write this entry. The other one was easier uh, but not so easy because uh, indigenous economies are so large in in its possible in their possibilities. Uh, if we are talking about the 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 indigenous people from Finland, and we if we are talking about the indigenous people in Latin American context, if we are talking about the indigenous people in the United States. So how not to now how not to be uh, global and at the same time make mistakes about the, the the way these people could be addressed in their uh, perspectives, you know what I mean? But yeah. uh, if it was possible to 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 increase the number of references, I could be happier. I'd say it was the okay. the most difficult. Yeah, actually, actually, the the length I gave uh, to all the authors was the kind of a result of hard negotiation with the publisher. You know, <laughs> so I, I asked you um, about. 4,000 words entry, but initially that was about 3,000 words entry. And we you know, negotiated with the publisher very hard, and then we got the 4,000 words entry as a result. But still, I, I fully understand that you know, uh, it could have been better you know, if we had more than 
4,000 words entry because all the topics you dealt with were kind of very much complicated sometimes and entry with uh, many references, many areas to be covered. So I have a great sympathy uh, on um, those aspects or on, on all the all those aspects of authors. So uh, I I just saw the hand but it's it gone it's gone. Okay. Um, Pushkar Aditya. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for giving yeah. me the opportunity. And uh, my question is to Lucian. And um, my name is Pushkar and I am a PhD scholar at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. So my question is regarding the uh, idea which um, Lucian is proposing, of decolonization or post-colonial theories. So uh, this there is a broader movement in uh, academia of decolonizing the theories in particularly in management and uh, other areas also so so what is the what do you think what is the future ahead like uh, if we are going to decolonize the theory then how we are going to theorize in the future and what is the future of this project of decolonization and uh, the are we going to move towards more towards practice or impact other than theories? Do you think there is a future in it? And uh, I would also like to know opinion of uh, my friend from Korea. Like uh, it is also a part of Asia. How do they think this uh, decolonization project in the academia? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I have a question to uh, all the participants in this webinar. You know. Um, when we started this project, we thought about just 40 entries. But uh, when, we had, when we started discussions about entries uh, within the editorial group, the number uh, increased to uh, 60. Uh, but the final result is the encyclopedia with 53, uh, 57 entries because we couldn't find author uh, who should write on uh, some issues like a construction sector and SSE and human rights and SSE. Uh, so, you know, we were trying to be comprehensive in terms of coverage of important issues of SSE, but we, we were not that successful uh, in terms of covering all those issues we initially wanted to cover, but I think all the uh, audience or participants in this webinar uh, may have some ideas about which issues should be covered in the future if you want to have second edition or third edition of Encyclopedia. So if you have any uh, you know, idea about those new issues, which should be covered in the a second or third edition of Encyclopedia, just uh, kind of uh, share your ideas. That is my question to all the uh, participants in this webinar. Uh, any, any, any other questions? Um, okay, if we, oh, okay, Suzanne. If so, can we can we write our ideas to you or um, oh, can no, we write I, you to could, the chat? Yeah chat as well and you can share your idea why it is important why do you think it should yeah. be covered yeah, 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 yeah. okay so Only if, the idea. yeah so Only if the you, idea. Mm, yeah okay i'm sorry i'm sorry no 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 i i will write it okay thank you so just uh, shall i throw my my question uh, at them right now or shall yeah, we yeah, wait yeah yeah, yeah. No, i would no. have two actually one is connected to what yeah. you mentioned, you know, that in the entries, you can sort of feel already what could be some of the topics of the of the future huh? for research. And so I was wondering if each of them could identify one or two within their entries, you know, just one or two, you know, because we're always thinking about the next generation huh, of SE scholars. What, what would be two issues, two areas, two 
paths that that you feel, you know, based on your expertise and your experience, uh, are promising for for researchers, you know, coming onto the field. That's the first one, and then the the um, the second one. I mean, would also go to you, Il Chung. And now that I'm thinking about it, it would be to all of us. Um, how do you see this encyclopedia being used in an innovative way? You know, I mean. How could we use it innovatively? You know, just we know that researchers could use it, but can we think of any other way? I mean, I'm thinking about youth uh, movements. I'm thinking about uh, teachers and high school, uh, um, you know, instructors. Just sort of to throw it uh, out there and to see what we can think together and some ideas that we may have had. Thank you. So first question was uh, directed to all of us. Okay. Um, I, I think the, that, that is the very interesting question. I mean, the two areas which can be promising areas for research for especially young, young scholars who just start master degree or you know, doctor degree. I think that that is very interesting question. Um, so we, we have so many questions. I mean, maybe we can go back to our panelists, Ricardo, Daboka, and Lucien. So uh, you can really choose interesting questions for your answer. Yeah, don't forget about uh, Pushkar's question to Lucien. Maybe we can begin with Lucien about decolonization thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pushka, for your question. Uh, I think that it's an easy question to answer, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, I think that India can help us in this challenge uh, because, as you, as you know, we have many authors coming from this context and the 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 seedbed of this discussion happened in India with Dipesh Chakrabarti, Gayatri Spivak, and other names. But I I'd say to 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 answer to you and at the same time to answer to Hosiu um, and the other question about the topic issues. Uh, that could be covered at the same time. I, I think that uh, the difference, if we, if we embrace this perspective, because of course, it depends on the way people will adhere or not to these perspectives, uh, post-colonial, uh, approach is, is still uh, an approach that sometimes people avoid to, to think of or to assume. But I think they should, not because they are effectively, not because they, they should, but sometimes they are not interested in discussing problems in the past, such as the colonization issue and the wound, wounds that remains uh, that remain uh, in the territories, in the westernized areas, as I said previously, but uh, especially because uh, there is an epistemic, an epistemological uh, challenge that uh, should be considered regarding the areas. I'm talking about the way we think, for example, uh, when we are th thinking about economics, what is the economy in itself? What is considered to be economics, uh, the economy, uh, for example? And the way we are looking at the concept and the way we are uh, having a relative reading on the authors we assume as the, the mentors, uh, we will define 
the way we can look broadly or not to some concepts. And for example, I think that a topic that is missing that could be very uh, interesting to be considered in social and solidarity economy is architecture in the sense of uh, urban planning, in the sense of uh, uh, landscape uh, perspectives, you know what I mean? Because solidarity economy uh, has to do with uh, the way we, we, you build the space for all. So, uh, but but the fact is, if we do not change the way we uh, think of the space, doesn't matter if you if you use or not this or that. Postcolonial could be of help, for example, to challenge the way we have we have uh, built the concept of the space and the right to the space, and the right to the city, and the right to the landscape, and the right to be part of uh, the imagery of the space. You know what I mean? So uh, the fact is, these uh, theories are relevant if we are really interested in questioning some basic concepts such as space, such as inclusion. We have talked about inclusion, but to what extent we are uh, capable of accepting the otherness without in asking to this otherness to be other issue, other, other person? You know what I mean? So uh, this is the point. Uh, we are understanding inclusion as a kind of concession from our part, or we are understanding inclusion as the possibility of being in touch with the difference, indeed. So uh, I think that some challenges are uh, connected in Europe, in the West, uh, are connected with the minorities and the way we will be effectively considering minorities in social and solidarity economy framework. So these perspectives could be useful to reframe the future or not. It depends upon the way we are reading these uh, facts. But to, to end up, because this is a complex question, of course, uh, Pushka, but I think that uh, something that was questioned by, by Jose about not only the topics and the issues, but uh, what will make a difference. I think that the basic concepts should be uh, the key words to be discussed, not, not exactly the areas. The areas are important, the architecture, the sociology, the anthropology, uh, the methodologies we have used. But in social solidarity economy framework, I think that our main concern could be how we have discussed not only the role played by the minorities, the role played by uh, social organizations regarding autonomy of communities, but more than everything, uh, the way we are available to discuss concepts that we are uh, used to designing in a specific way in a westernized way of thinking, and that could assume different uses for different people all over the world. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. I think the, you know, um, the fundamental idea uh, of this SSE 
is related to power relationship, isn't it? So I, I would define SSE in terms of power concepts like um, you know, resistance, uh, subaltern movement, and decolonization, of course. So I think um, if, if we focus on those characteristics, key characteristics of SSE related to power relationship, I think we can find many entry points into decolonization movement whether it is concept, whether it is discourse, mm -hmm. whether it is action. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that would be one kind of pathway we can use to explore the meaning of SSE for decolonization. And I have another question or uh, comment from Isabel. Isabel, floor is yours. Hi, hello. Uh, well, my name is Isabel. I'm a PhD student in University of Salamanca in Spain, but now I'm uh, doing a research study in, at Oxford. Um, I'm studying uh, reintegration of former combatants, and I arrived to the theme of social and solidarity economies, because in Colombia, they use it as a strategy to include all the people that was uh, belonging to the armed groups. But I, I want to I want to ask if you um, find the same things that I that I uh, discover in my theme that it was some drivers and some constraints factors. One of the drivers was the shared capabilities, as we were talking before, shared um, conversion factors and local development. But there was a. Um, but it remains uh, some constraints about the, the formalization. I mean, not the how they formalize that cooperatives or their social and solidarity economies. It was uh, because they were um, rural actors, so they don't know so much more about the paperwork, all the things, or all the issues that remains that uh, they uh, keep fixed to the informal market. And the second point was the 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 capacity to absorb all the members to provide a sustainable sustainable job i mean in a long term uh, reintegration because sometimes they don't even the lack of resources they don't provide a, or cover all the members that was my question thank you our panelist um should remember this question and those questions before these questions raised by Rocio and me. So uh, I will go back to Daboka and uh, Ricardo. Um, thank you, Il Chung, and I'm really sorry, I, I will need to go soon. Uh, so I will just quickly answer your question. Um, from my perspective and, and from the uh, topic of my uh, entry, what has opened to me and from my work with, with students, I think that um, the, uh, the field of digital technologies is uh, under, underseen, in a, uh, underrepresented in, in um, studies on social and solidarity economy. And it's really related to different modes of how youth today functions. Um, and the other thing is about set of values, which uh, from my perspective is quite important, uh, meaning uh, mainly with trust and different sorts of collective uh, engagement that should be somehow embraced, but not only uh, uh, like uh, between the same groups, but with different stakeholders, different levers, different uh, ages and so on. So I think, those uh, two um, topics would be quite interesting to uh, for for future studies. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you all, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I have to leave now. Thank you. Bye bye. And Ricardo, let's see if I can keep all the questions <laughs> uh, <laughs> straight now. But um, so on the topics for future research. So one premise is that I'm not a researcher. So, I'm, you know, I'm, 
take that with the with the grain of salt. But if I think about finance uh, and the, specifically social economy, uh, financial institutions, I think that a big topic of research, this goes back to something the worker was saying uh, to youth, also has to do with uh, digital technologies and the impact of digitalization that um, can have a really pervasive effect especially when we talk about organizations that are often based on interpersonal relationships and trust. And you could see the effect of digitalization in finance on the one hand, uh, favoring some kind of disintermediation, which in some ways could be an opportunity, um, but also creating other types of uh, economic effects and power structures and how do you, you know, run data and, and all that stuff and how do you bring that back also within the social economy logic and approach. So I think there's a lot of interesting topics there to look at um, the potential risks and opportunities of digitalization and uh, information technologies specifically related to social economy financial institutions. Um, so I would say that uh, the the in terms of the the use the different uses for the encyclopedia I I think it has the potential to be really useful kind of um, training tool or you know something to use to kind of introduce people to the to the SSC and um, be a useful resource yeah I can see in some kind of trainings or uh, you know. So uh, the this also relates to the, you know, we we're talking about the length of the entries earlier, and that is really kind of a, a double-edged sword, right? The the length, but I think there's some really good the good side to having shorter entries because it forces you to kind of you can't put everything in there, but you have to put enough to give a, a good overview so that people get people interested in wanting to learn more and then go deeper into it, right? So that's, I think that 4,000 words length, um, no, no, if we want to put a positive spin on it, I would say that uh, it creates an opportunity to introduce somebody uh, to a topic and, and give them just enough to keep them interested and in wanting to learn more. And I think that's definitely a, a use that I see for the SSC it, it, encyclopedia is clearly useful for researchers. You can get references, you can look at what kind of research has been going on on a lot of different topics, but also for people who are approaching this world uh, for the first time and, and want to learn more. It's a really good initial overview. Um, on the on the last question, um, I'm really not um, not an expert. Uh, the, of what's going on specifically in Colombia around the use, you know, social economy as a vehicle for work integration um, of ex-combatants and, and so forth. But then there are two things I think that um, I would say to that based on other, you know, knowledge of these organizations in other context. Um, one is that there is a lot of experience and expertise and skills around work integration across a variety of different categories of people within social economy organizations. Uh, but the other is a caveat of these ultimately being kind of entrepreneurial organizations that need to have an inherent, you know, sustainability. And uh, that dimension sometimes is overlooked, but it's it's very important. Um, and sometimes there's a risk of kind of top-down approaches of saying, oh yeah, we need to create a bunch of cooperatives so that the people can then find work in them. But if it's not a, a bottom-up uh, phenomenon of people wanting to work together in an entrepreneurial way to be part of the same enterprise and carry on a venture together, then that can really make it hard uh long term for sustainability so i think sometimes we don't pay a lot of enough attention to the kind of uh enabling factors for the success of these organizations that have to do a lot with mutual trust and knowledge and attitude and culture um and uh, but those ultimately are very important to their success great thank you very much um 
I think how to use this encyclopedia wisely or effectively, I think um, I thought about ChatGPT these days. <laughs> ChatGPT uh, can produce kind of 4,000 words explanations about anything, you know, with uh, accumulated data on the net. And one characteristic of ChatGPT is it cannot provoke discussion. It's a just a general explanation which can be accepted, nine, accepted by 99% of people. But I think our encyclopedia can generate discussions, even criticisms, different opinions. So I think that is the beauty of encyclopedia, which is aligned with the spirit of SSE. SSE is not carved in stone. It is kind of dynamics, moving things, organic one. So the SSE of the 19th century can be different from the SSE of the 20th century. And SSE of the 20th century should be different from the SSE of the 21st century. And I think in that sense, our SSE uh, encyclopedia, I hope, um, can produce discussions, uh, can produce discourse about different solutions to different same problems. And that is one uh, kind of a use, wise use of encyclopedia. So we are not going to provide kind of ready-made answer to everything or to one specific issue. We just provided one opinion with the comprehensive explanation about the issue. And there will be some kind of challenges or criticisms which help which will help us to come up with better innovative answers to problems we are facing today. With that, thank you very much for your participation and for your reference, it is free. It is free to read, free to transfer, free to disseminate. Read and challenge our encyclopedia. <laughs> have a good morning, have a good afternoon, have a good evening, and we will see you again in different place and time. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you.